Uh, welcome for coming along. Uh, my name's Richard Dennis. Uh, I'm the director of the Australia Institute. And if you haven't been to politics in the pub before, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, the Australia Institute puts politics in the pub on here uh, about once a month. And uh, before we get started, I'll uh, I'll give you a few. Um, uh, I'll give you a little bit of information. Uh, our next event, our next politics in the pub event, which will be here, uh, is. Is, hold your mic up, Richard. Uh, <laughs> very subtle, Ben. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, is uh, Wednesday the 22nd of August, uh, so next week, 6 till 7. It's pretty much always 6 till 7. Uh, and the event is Canberra's housing stress, uh, where we're looking at um, uh, the affordability of home uh, ownership in Australia and rental um, with... Uh, uh, with, with Adrian Pisaki, the Chair of National Shelter, uh, and Rosalind Dundas, the Director of ACTCOS, and Andrew McKenzie, uh, who's a lecturer in Landscape Architecture at the Uni of Canberra. Uh, so that's our, that's our next Politics in the Pub event. Um, the best way to know about uh, our events is to put your email address on a clipboard that'll be floating around uh, later today. Um, we, as I said, we put them on about once a month, but we wait till we get great speakers, so it's not first Wednesday in every month or anything, so we do need to be able to contact you. And um, yeah, uh, at the, the format for tonight's event is that I'm going to uh, fire a few questions at Simon, uh, and then, what do you reckon that's then? I think you might. Okay, and Sam McLean, uh, the, the new director of Get Up, is uh, winging his way to us, we think. Uh, so He's already on, uh, on National Director time. Okay, <laughs> he's already behaving like Simon, he's running late. Um, so, uh, so either I'll chat to Simon and Sam, or, or just Simon, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, and uh, we'll aim to wrap it up about 7 o'clock. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and then Simon and Sam are going to free, be free to stick around and, and say hello and have a beer afterwards. So, so relax and uh, thank you very much uh, for coming along. Uh, and now uh, let me introduce to you uh, Simon Shaith, the, the former uh, director of, of Get Up, uh, but someone whose heart I think is still very much uh, in, in what's been achieved. Uh, and as I said, Sam McLean, who will be here a little later, the, the, the new director of Get Up. So uh, please uh, join me in, in welcoming Simon Shay. So we're just going to do a bit of Q&A tonight rather than Simon give you a speech. But uh, I'm going to bowl up a really hard question for him to get the ball rolling. And, and that is, Simon, uh, you, you were in the role for four years. In, in 2008, uh, Kevin Rudd was the Prime Minister. Um, most Australians seem concerned about climate change and uh, we, we had quite a different policy on asylum seekers. Um, four years, it's, uh, well we're told a week is a long time in politics, so four years has seen uh, so quite a few changes. From, from your point of view, looking back, what have been, uh, what have been the, the, the highlights, I suppose? What have, been, what have been the most interesting, unexpected or, um, or, or rewarding things? Yeah, thanks, Richard. And uh, it's just really lovely to be here and see such a great crowd out tonight. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And it shows you that there's still so much interest in public policy. Uh, and I think over the, over the last few years, actually, that's been one of the debates that our media seems to have. They seem to be telling us all the time people are getting less and less interested in politics. So overall, the thing that, that I've been most excited about over the years is, is every opportunity to meet our members because you get to hear the most extraordinary stories. Uh, there are a couple of surprises, though, uh, over the years. One, of course, uh, was down here in Canberra at the High Court. I uh, would be remiss of me not to mention that. Um, one of the proudest days of my life was walking out of that court, uh, knowing that we had won and, uh, and changed the Constitution. This was the case uh, around John Howard's electoral laws, where we tried to run a little campaign successfully. Uh, to overturn them by calling them unconstitutional. This is where he limited people's opportunities, particularly young people's opportunities to enrol to vote uh, by reducing the time uh, down to as low as a couple of hours from seven days. So an extraordinary change that he made. And knowing that Get Up members were the ones who voted for us to go to court, knowing that Get Up members were the plaintiffs in the case, I mean, it was a fantastic opportunity to show all of our sister organisations around the world how this model could be used differently. Because so much of where we've come from is petitions and online emails, these kinds of things. But every time we had an opportunity to use different tactics to get that outcome was just a wonderful thing. 
Yeah, well, look, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think um, and the Australian Institute and, uh, and, and GetUp work well together and Simon and I have uh, worked together on many things and for me, I think that High Court case was such a clear demonstration of your capacity of an organisation representing such a large group of people to do something sort of much bigger and more importantly, I think, more far more unexpected than people were assuming. It wasn't just a bunch of people saying we're angry about something, it was... Uh, it was a group taking a, an important case to court and, and getting a win. So yeah, I think that's where collective organising is at its best, when it isn't just complaining about something, when it's advocating for a solution. Uh, that's why I, you know, I love direct action still on occasion, although not in, not in that uh, not in that role. Well, what about, for example? Uh, I, I mean, I think GetUp's done some very interesting things directly in auspicing uh, engagement in, say, the debate about logging in, in Tasmania, where you know, informing customers about products, for example, is really quite a different role than signing a petition. Yeah, one of the things I guess that's changed in act in online activism, if you if you want to call it that, over the last few years is that our targets have expanded. Uh, really, the biggest change I think that GetUp has seen in the last four years, other than its sheer growth, most of which was unexpected, uh, is its capacity now to use uh, collective action to target corporations. And I think that's important because one thing that's changed over the last four or five years is that vested interests have become even more powerful uh, in Parliament House. And therefore, our capacity to influence corporate decision makers is really crucial. The campaign that I think you were referring to, Richard, is when we targeted a range of people, including Harvey Norman, uh, who were stocking some uh, old growth forests in their furniture chain. And that really, I mean, I will never forget the day that Jerry Harvey was on the phone. I have to hold it out here. <laughs> it was incredible. He never, he just didn't see anything like this coming. Absolutely bowled him over. And I think that just shows you that when, when tens of thousands of people come together, what we can achieve is just so much more than what we could do on our own. Yeah, and, and I guess for me, I mean, most people sort of think of Get Up, I suppose, as as online <clears throat> and as, as petitions. But, uh, you know, clearly that's not been the case with the High Court case and, and with the Harvey Norman case. Um, that, that, I don't think, was anticipated by our political process or, or even corporate decision-making. And similarly, I mean, I, I remember, uh, I remember uh, Get Up... Um, I remember talking to your predecessor, Brett, and when he left, a lot of people thought, oh, yeah, a quarter of a million people joining an organisation, that's pretty big. It's going to be a lot easier to organise uh, under a, sort of a Howard government that will be under a Labor government. And, you know, what are you up to now? 600,000? Yeah. I mean, how... <laughs> How, how did you pull that off? <laughs> uh, and, and can you help us all do that? <laughs> uh, well, I think to some extent, uh, scale builds scale. So the first 250,000, you know, the ball's rolling at that point, and that actually is important. But one of the lessons we've learnt over the years is that, uh, particularly I think the online environment, if you're not completely honest and straight to the point, you really can't build that kind of membership base. I think this is the difference between our political parties. There's so much spin mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. that actually we see right through it and they don't realise, but they're addicted to it. They can't get out of it. I mean, it's incredible. Whereas what we've been able to do is just tell it how it is. And I think that's, you know, that's because we're in a luxurious position. It's because it's our job to disrupt politics, to tell it how it is. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful job, a wonderful role to have in society. But I think that that has been the most crucial thing that I've learned is that, is that being simple and straight to the point um, and being completely honest all the time uh, really carries a movement and grows it online. Of course, there are a whole bunch of technical things that we do to help uh, reach more people, but you know that's sort of more boring. Than, uh, <laughs> we don't need to get into that. No worries. And look, but I, I guess on that, uh, there, you know, you, you talked about being able to get straight to the point and see straight through the spin and say, you know, on behalf of a large number of people, you know, we think A is better than B. Where do you see? Uh, you know, what are the hardest issues in Australian politics? Where are, where are the ones where it's hardest for all groups, including Get Up, to, to sort of participate in those sorts of things? Yeah, a couple come to mind. Uh, on the domestic front, uh, we spend a lot of our time as uh, activists talking about what we want our government to do, what we want them to spend money on, where we want their priorities to be. But one of the most challenging issues, but I think one of the most important, is where do they get that money from? 
the revenue side of the equation. Uh, this is where the Australian Institute's work is fantastic because it's one of the few groups who are out there willing to talk about tax policy, which I think is absolutely one of the most crucial questions we have as a country. If we're going to invest in clean energy, then we've got to understand tax policy. If we want to have a national disability insurance scheme, we have to understand where we're spending our money elsewhere and what our priorities are going to be. However, that conversation is very hard to have because it's hard to distill it into sound bites. It's not impossible, and I think we're all getting better about it, but the way uh, progressive groups are organised is that so many of them are issue-specific, the environment movement or the human rights movement. Therefore, it's very hard to say, actually, for all of us, we need to be worried about what our government is doing, the size of our government, how we're going to be making sure we have the revenue to underpin our nation's future. That's on the domestic front. Uh, I also think it's very difficult for Australians still to get engaged in foreign policy. Um, for much the same reason, as, uh, as I said before, about sound bites and how hard it is to distill foreign policy into that, we, any, basically any foreign policy issue you can come up with, uh, you'll see the Australian media covering a good side and a bad side, the Free Syrian Army versus Assad. The reality in every debate, almost every debate, uh, when it comes to foreign policy is it's very hard to say objectively that there's a good side and a bad side, and yet that's what we want to hear. You know, the uncertainty that comes with foreign policy means that we actually don't do anything, we don't advocate for, many, for very many outcomes. And I think that that's one of the greatest challenges we have as a society, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with policy debates where there's uncertainty. The same can be said for the population issue. And that, again, another really challenging one that we've got to come to grips with, but one that we're, which really has an overriding sense of uncertainty about what the solutions are. And so therefore we seem to have this paralysis, which means we don't do anything at all. Yeah, well, certainly I, I agree with you about the, the, well, all of those things. I mean, the, the, the tax debate, the population debate, um, these, these the, the, the sort of meta issues, I suppose, they, they affect all areas of policy and therefore there aren't vested interests really uh, set up for them. So to that extent, given GetUp's capacity to speak to its membership directly, um, how do you see what's happening with the media? Because you know, it's, it's one of their jobs to communicate complex things to us. Uh, if we have simple sort of observations about foreign policy, it's partly because of the media, but at the same time they have to sell newspapers, and if they fill them with articles that no one wants to read, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's yeah. not going to help anyone either. And, and that's why Lindsay Tanner wrote in his book that essentially we get the media that we deserve. Uh, I'm not sure I completely agree with that point of view. Um, a lot of people talk about the internet as, you know, the new frontier and therefore we don't really need regulation and we don't need public investment. I mean, I hate to see the budget of the ABC in five to six years. I suspect it'll be slashed uh, if, uh, if the Tories get into power. Um, these are very concerning issues, uh, but uh, what I find intriguing is that when we ask GetUp members, what do you think that GetUp actually does? Uh, why are you a member of GetUp or why do you subscribe? Uh, actually, a lot of what we hear are things that relate to the media. A lot of what we hear is, I find out things that I wouldn't otherwise find out about. I hear things that I wouldn't otherwise hear about. And so that gives me some hope that we can reach people directly. The challenge is, can we do it on a daily and an hourly basis? Because that's how our politics has become. And as that happens, me, the media are looking to strip down costs and give us as many cookie-cutter responses as they can. So how we deal with uh, that, I think first and foremost is through public investment. Now, I don't really think that there's anything, any amount of regulation that can compete with public investments in a national broadcaster and potentially in a whole range of other areas. What about, for example, startup grants for entrepreneurial media sites online? There are some market failures here that I think des are deserving are of public Are you asking dollars. for some money here to <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a project that's too big for me. Well, I mean, but with that, I mean, you know, we do... Uh, you know, I guess there's an irony. We, 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 thanks to the internet, we have organisations like GetUp have developed. Thanks to the internet, your capacity to communicate with people is far greater than it used to be. And thanks to the internet, should we wish to, we can go read the New York Times or we can read a European newspaper, but most of us don't. Yeah. I mean, you know, the irony, I suppose, in the information age is because there's so much of it, um, we're not sure which, what to tune into. So yeah. what's, what's GetUp's role, or an organisation like GetUp's role, you know, in, in that environment? I don't think it's as simple as saying information overload equals paralysis. I know that's logical, but what I see happening, uh, the Prime Minister talks a lot about this in private, 
Uh, one of her concerns over the last few years has been the change in the media landscape. I guess that's obvious now. She does talk about that publicly as well. Uh, and what we've what what she I think she's got it right when she says these days people online are reading what they want to read. And so what we find is we've, we're going into these groups, these smaller and smaller groups. Yeah. If you don't believe in climate change, the only thing you read is information about how you're right not yeah. to believe in climate change. You don't get challenged anymore because we don't have, uh, we have declining numbers of people reading the most important of our media, the media that challenges us. And that is one of the greatest challenges we find, but it's also an opportunity. For a group like GetUp, it's an opportunity to speak more and more uh, to its membership, uh, more and more about a broader set of issues, not just campaigning, but there is an opportunity, I guess, to communicate about news and events as well. It's not one that Get Up has seized on yet, but it's certainly one that I can see coming. Um, look, I, I think that's a that's an interesting point. Are, is, is the Prime Minister accusing Get Up of only I think saying the same uh, things to the same people, or is she seeing you as a <laughs> uh, as as a solution to this problem? Uh, probably uh, a little from column A, a little from column B. <laughs> We're not well loved around Parliament House, let's be honest. <laughs> not well loved at all. Well, uh, but I, I think her, when I've spoken to her about this, her point has been about climate sceptics. No one effective is ever loved in Parliament yeah. House, Simon. Um, <laughs> the, well, I actually think that's true. I think that you know we, we've actually created a politics that is designed to make everybody happy. The only way to actually push change is to make someone feel uncomfortable, to, you know, to walk into a polite conversation where everyone's happy with the way it is and say, well, we want it to be different. So, uh, you know, have you got any examples of when, when GetUp has had to do that? Or, or, or similarly, you know, what are the challenges yeah. when, when you're picking those fights? When, when, when a lot of people are very happy with the way things are and, you know, what are you doing showing up, you know, suggesting we need to change? Yeah, and I think as progressives we talk a lot about change, so we're always having those uncomfortable conversations as part of our role. But what I think was a particularly uncomfortable moment that comes to mind, I think was in 2008 in December. Uh, Kevin Rudd had uh, very recently announced the 5% emissions reductions target. My immediate reaction, this will sound ambitious, overly ambitious now, but my immediate reaction was, wow, he's forgotten the zero. <laughs> we had all these signs out there on the Lords of Parliament House 50%. Can you imagine now if I, was, if I went about advocating for 50% emissions reduction targets? But that was only four years ago. That that's what we were talking about. That's what the scientists were saying was needed. The most conservative estimates were 40%. Anyhow, uh, up until that point, uh, Kevin Rudd had huge approval ratings amongst progressive-minded Australians, and we had a great challenge in that moment. Um, we, you know, a lot of people were paralysed by thinking, well, we kind of like that guy, we don't mind his government, or at least we had a lot of hope that they would be different, and there's that 5% target. And we had the uncomfortable role, and I think it was the right decision, to put a TV ad out. That was the first really critical ad uh, that we had put out against the ALP that, that particular year after his election. And it was a tough decision because a lot of people were still hoping that you know, maybe somewhere in there there's a real policy. It was 5 to 50, there was a range. <laughs> <laughs> no, the range of torture was 5 to 50. I remember. Uh, and, and so we put this TV ad, you might remember, it was called Spot the Difference, and it was John Howard watching the soccer, but we had uh, we got that footage of John Howard watching the soccer and awkwardly jumping up and down as only John Howard could, <laughs> applauding. And we'd superimposed Kevin Rudd's speech at the National Press Club on the TV and put it out uh, to make the point that John Howard's cheering. You know? <laughs> he is loving Kevin Rudd's climate policy, it's such a dud. And, uh, and we didn't know which way it was going to go. We weren't sure where, our, where, where, where Australians were up to, where progressive-minded Australians were up to. But from that moment on, what I, what I saw was a licence to go and be critical of anyone in politics because we'd shown uh, that at the end of the day, we can't have hope in any single party or any single politician. We've got to collectively organise no matter who's in government. Um, I don't know if you remember, we had we had a barbecue the day before the uh, the five percent announcement. It was, uh, in hindsight, one of the most naive barbecues in uh, <laughs> political history. I, I won't say who was there, but let's just say there were a bunch of people who were a little bit disappointed the next day. Um, Look, so I, I think that's a, a very important point, and you know, I guess we, in a, in a smaller way, notice that at the institute. If you, if you just say it as it is, and you let the chips fall where they may, you you often end up disappointing people because they reckon you're not on their team. But at least it's easier to figure out, you know, what you've said and, and what you're going to say next. So, uh, yeah, I guess um, before we uh, flip over to Sam, um, 
you know, I guess, uh, what, are, what are the key lessons you've learnt? I mean, four, four interesting years at the coalface of Australian politics at a pretty interesting time. Um, yeah. One, uh, two lessons come to mind. Uh, one is that there's nothing that can match speaking from the heart. I think as Australians, we don't see in our politicians enough of that. But as progressive-minded people, uh, we have a foundation of empathy. And our job as progressives is to increase everybody's circle of empathy, if you like. And we do that at GetUp by introducing them to new stories uh, and situations they may not have heard of. Because it's easy for me to care about you. I like a jumper. I like you. I, I can care about you. But when I start, <laughs> it's actually quite a nice jumper. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it's harder for me to care about a broader group of people. But that is our core challenge as progressives. And what I've learned is that there's nothing that can match speaking from the heart to shift people away from an intellectual version of politics that I think it fails us uh, because it means that we don't actually work out what we're supposed to be focusing on. The second thing I've learnt, going back to the High Court case, is that nothing pays off like courage. Uh, you've got to have the courage of your convictions. It was a very tough decision that this movement made uh, to go to the High Court because get up uh, had we lost would have been up for costs for the Commonwealth. <laughs> And they spend up on their barristers, let me tell you. You want to know where your tax dollars are going? They don't come cheap. Uh, and so that would have put us very close to bankruptcy. And that's a pretty tough decision to make. Uh, but the movement had a vote, they decided to do it, and I think that GetUp members made the right decision at that point in time. And that kind of courage is going to be needed in the future because right now as we sit here, uh, vested interests are growing their power to organise they're growing their power to influence what happens in Parliament House. And their goal is to rip up the egalitarian social contract that is at the core of what this nation stands for and, and, and lives off. And that, I think, uh, gives us uh, our courage. The, uh, the, what's happening on the other side inspires us to have that courage. And I hope it will continue to inspire Sam and, and every other Get Up member in the future. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to talk to Sam for a while before we do Q&A with both. But please uh, join me in thanking uh, Simon. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, Richard. Flights uh, made it on time or made it eventually? This is why I usually catch the bus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, in any case, anyone isn't sure, uh, Sam McLean is the, the new national director of GetUp and uh, uh, has been working at, uh, at GetUp for, for many years. So why don't, why don't we start with that? How, how did you get involved in, in GetUp? Uh, well, I walked into the doors of GetUp um, when we, uh, we had an office with uh, four staff. Um, and a rat. Um, is that the one on Park Street, or? It was yeah. It was on. It was on. The, there were two floors of the Edinburgh Castle Hotel. Yeah, the and one floor of, of Get Up. And this was the floor that the pub deemed, uh, you know, unfit for use, um, <laughs> on account of the the rusty nails and um, and the rat um, Lester, um, <laughs> who survived in the end on um, on fortune cookies because during the 2007 election one thing we did was hand out um, at polling booths you know everybody was getting around handing out how to vote cards for different parties and um, to be a little bit different we handed out fortune cookies you know, you know fortune if you you were standing in line to vote you could have a fortune cookie and open up and say you, know, you will vote for you know, a politician <laughs> who will you know who will tackle climate change um, and, um, and it worked well <laughs> That's unclear. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we had about 10,000 East Fortune cookies left over in the office on, on, which, on which Lester um, feasted for months. So I started to get up in, uh, when, when that was the scene. And, um, you know, there were four and a half staff and, um, in Lester. And um, I was 19. And um, I, you know, walked into the office uh, and said, I really... Uh, love what GetUp does, and I would love to um, to um, devote all my energy to this. I need about 200 bucks a week to pay my rent, and um, I'll work my butt off, I promise. And um, so they put me on a project that was called uh, Oz in 30 Seconds. We um, we invited Australians to make their own political TV ads. Uh, people could make a TV ad, submit it, uh, vote online for the TV ads that other GetUp members had made that they liked, uh, and then we had a, a big competition, chose the best one, and, and put it on TV as a fundraiser. Um, and so that was the you know the first project that I got stuck into at GetUp, um, and um, you know it was pretty con you know it was it was a pretty different idea at that time for for citizens to be airing their own TV ads. Now GetUp members are the biggest progressive advertisers in the country, um, and spend multiple millions of dollars on um, on 
powerful TV ads, but at that time it was um, you know it was a very new thing, and so I was um, you know three months into my role uh, at Gab as a volunteer, uh, we had this big event at the Opera House where we had a, a gala, and we, you know Margaret Pomerantz came along, and I was like, oh my god, that's a Margaret Pomerantz. Uh, <laughs> once I got over Margaret Pomerantz sitting next to me, um, <laughs> we um, you know we chose the best ad, and um, and some media came. We weren't super organised at the time, and um, hadn't really thought about how we would deal with media showing up to this event that we ran. Um, and um, in their infinite wisdom, uh, you know, uh, Brett, who was the director at the time, said to me, well, there's some media over there, why don't you go and talk to them? 19-year-old um, volunteer with, um, you know, long flowing locks and um, <laughs> no clue in the world. And um, I was standing on the steps of the Opera House, um, you know, giving an interview to the Sydney Morning Herald and um, doing a live interview on, on uh, Radio National about this, you know, this ad that we'd created and rated and, and um, donated to put on air on TV and I thought, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it. This is alright, I can do this. Um, and, and when was that, 2008? That was 2007. Oh, 2007, pre-election. So, um, uh, so I guess, you know, the, the, the big question, you know, we, we talked about before you got here, um, you know, we talked about uh, when Brett left, some people sort of said, well, 250,000 people probably can't do more than that. You know, Simon's come along and, and, and uh, under, not just Simon, obviously, but the team in that period, GetUp's grown substantially. Um, where to from here for GetUp? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that numbers is, a, is always um, is one metric to measure uh, movement by, but I, I don't think it's the best one. Um, you know, if you look at, I mean, Simon's done an incredible job over the last four years. The number of GetUp members has gone from about 250,000 to 600. Um, more importantly, I think, you know, the number of people who are donating the number of people who are taking action, who are showing up to events, who are volunteering on, um, you know, on the ground, um, has increased massively and increased as a proportion. So not only do we have you know, more than double as many people, but the percentage of people who are taking every action, the, the percentage of people who are seeing things that they love so much they want to donate to it, the percentage of people are turning out is higher. And I think that th that is the real measure. I mean, um, I think it's much more about the depth of engagement and how, um, how involved people are rather than how many, um, how many they are. So I think um, in the next couple of years, what we really want to see is um, is GetUp members have uh, more capacity, uh, more networks in their local area, uh, more ability to influence um, not just the national debate but also uh, create change on a local level and with and with uh, corporations as well. So we've started um, very recently something called Community Run, which is a, a new platform. The idea of which is that um, all the tools that um, you know, the GetUp campaigns run on, the GetUp staff can, can use to, to start those campaigns. Um, creating a petition website, um, aggregating names, um, being able to email MPs, being able to collect data and, and keep people involved in a campaign is something that we're making available to anybody who wants to start their campaign. Um, uh, one of the best examples so far is um, the, the crew who are campaigning to save the ANU School of Music, who have been running a fantastic campaign and good on it. Um, I think have you've got um, a warm crowd here. <laughs> have, and I mean, and this is a group of people who've, who've been um, running a campaign for quite a while now and have, and have got some real wins under the belt, but um, jumped on this tool and, um, and found in, they put up, I got an SMS from one of my colleagues who got up on a Friday night at six o'clock and um, said, there's this, there's this petition on, on Community Run, the a Save the ANU School of Music. They've got 2,000 signatures in, in five hours. It's like, bloody hell. Um, at 10 o'clock I got a message from the same person saying they've got 8,000 signatures um, and by the end of the weekend they had 23,000 signatures and this was, you know, it had started from nothing and, and just virally grown um, and um, I think, I hope it's been a real boon to, to that campaign so is that kind of um, get up members not just as, you know, as um, you know, players in, in get up campaigns but as networked locals who, you know, have some tools at their disposal who can start incredible local campaigns and, and national campaigns as well and find other GetUp members who can help them out, find people who can do the design for the flyers, who can help them organise the rally, who can uh, you know, put, put their banners in storage and, and, um, you know, and hopefully you know, GetUp can help campaigns like that then get ads in the local papers and, and take them to victory. Um, Simon was talking about the, um, was it the circle of empathy. Um, the, the idea that we need to you know grow the uh, the, the people's uh, the, grow the size of the, the the population that people sort of feel empathy towards um, the kind of uh, the kind of structures you've just talked about then obviously seem aimed at doing that 
uh, are you picturing that's happening online and offline? I mean, you know, obviously the advantage of uh, online communication is the capacity to talk to lots of people, mm. but people do, you know, respond differently to people they meet. So uh, are you talking about the capacity to help people in their local area sort of come together physically as well as share information? Yeah, I, I don't think that campaigns, I mean, you know, we say that, um, I often say that every good campaign starts with a petition. Uh, and every bad campaign ends with a petition, right? <laughs> um, and I don't think that a petition uh, tool by itself um, really changes, um, wins any campaigns. Very infrequently does it get up petition by itself, and it, sometimes it really happens, uh, you know, animal exports, you know, big campaigns can really get some momentum, and a petition can really make a difference. But much more frequently, um, you know, a petition is a way of bringing together, of collating a group of people um, who give a shit, um, and then using, you know, that... Uh, that community to drive deeper, further action. So, you know, I think uh, the moments when GetUp members are at their most powerful are when we we get together in person, and um, when we're on the ground at polling booths talking to people. Um, when uh, you know, when we're whether that's on the way in or as it was with David Hicks, talking to people on the way out of polling booths, um, asking them to sign letters to their constituents and building those connections. So, um, what I see for the next couple of years is um, a GetUp community that is. Uh, connected much more locally and face-to-face -face meetings because those local groups, um, you know, five to ten people, like the ANU School of Music campaign, uh, uh, how campaigns get one. All right. Well, I'll ask uh, Sam one more question, and then we're we're going to go to questions uh, from from the audience. Um, uh, I guess a simple question. I, I I hope Sam, you know, you've uh, you've just stepped into one of the more interesting jobs in Australian <coughs> politics. Um, are you nervous? <laughs> no, not really. Uh, <laughs> is that enough? No, no. Well, uh, is there anything that you know? Is is there anything that you do worry about, or is there, or put another way, you know, are there things you can you, that you really hope to achieve, or you really hope to avoid? I mean, it's a fascinating time to come into the role. Yeah, it's a very interesting time, and I'm excited about it, um, much more so than than nervous. Um, excited because. Um, you know, th we're coming up to a really Im important and, um, you know, potentially quite depressing time in Australian politics. Um, we might be looking. You at might need to be clearer with them, Sam. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at uh, in 2015 having a very conservative federal government and a conservative government in every state around the country. We're looking at, um, you know wall-to-wall -wall conservative governments and if you look at um, you know what conservative governments have done when they've come into power in Victoria uh, in Queensland and New South Wales it's a very it's a pretty clear template for for what could happen across the country uh, social services are first on the block um, as little as they come uh, stuff like the sisters and side program in Queensland a hundred and fifty thousand dollar project you know hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars helping um, you know uh, female prisoners um, a, a, project that actually saves the government money, right, is on the chopping block. The first thing, um, you know, changing the status of same-sex relationships to being a registered relationship, like a registered sex offender or something. Um, taking away rights, not, pro not progressing rights, not giving people more rights, not building equality, but taking away rights people already have. Um, and that's the second thing on the agenda, and cutting, um, cutting support for renewable energy, cutting the solar feed-in tariffs, cutting uh, support for, for wind farms. These are the things that are on the agenda for c these governments as they've come in, and I think we're looking at, a, at what could be a very depressing time for, um, for many um, progressives. But it's in times like that when we need community more than ever. Uh, we, more than ever. We need to feel and know that um, we're not alone in our bedrooms you know, or, or our living rooms you know, just shouting at the television, that there are tens of thousands of, of other people who are shouting at the television at the same time. Uh, but, but who are gonna who are gonna shout at the TV tonight and then can get together and do something about it um, in the morrow. And I think that um, you know the only thing that makes me um, that makes me nervous about it is um, that you know we're gonna have to choose carefully which fights we want to pick because there'll be a lot of them and they're, they're all important. But uh, uh, you know there are a great number of GetUp members across the country who are um, 
with greyer, older, wiser um, heads than, than mine, and um, I'll be leaning on them pretty heavily, so I'm not nervous at all. Look, I, I like the shouting at the television. I'm thinking, you know, you read Fairfax online, it's like number of people reading this now. It'd be nice if when you're watching television, you know, you'd, you'd all press a button on our remote controller, like, shouting at the television Number of people shouting at Scott right Morrison now, right yeah. now. It might just make us feel that we're not quite so alone. Um, well, look, let's move to uh, phase three of tonight. Simon, if you come back up, um, I'll just... You're going to sit on my lap? How are we going? No, no, I'm going to spot questions from the okay. sidelines, and Simon and you are both going to answer questions. Congratulations on taking on Woolworths in the courts. Thank you. Uh, again, a great effort. Um, the uh, the thing is, of course, that, that that's only half the battle. The other half is to win the vote in the EGM. Uh, are you developing a campaign to muster the members who are also shareholders in Woolworths, who are also members of super funds, who are members of all sorts of other things that can impinge on Woolworths, because the big corporate end of town is going to run that vote and that end of town, particularly through the super funds, has got to know that their members are concerned about this. Uh, that's a good point. Um, the, yeah, we, we are running a campaign talking to institutional investors and super funds about, um, about the upcoming vote. This is a vote at the Woolworths Extraordinary General Meeting that GetUp members have been able to um, uh, to precipitate um, on changing the company's constitution to um, to prevent the company from uh, making well to limit the amount of money that they take from problem problem gamblers um, in an hour. Um, it's going to be a very hard fight to to win at that constitution. There are a number of, number of big vested interests who you know who would like to see that vote go down. Uh, it would be very difficult, and Woolworths um, you know has been I have to say you know, very reluctant and. Um, and uh, very obstinate. Um, I think that um, the path to victory on pokey reform um, doesn't mean that we have to win that vote. It doesn't all come down to that vote. What it comes down to is sustaining the rage um, over you know, a course of years. We, we tried through Parliament to, to get a commitment to limiting um, the damage of pokey machines and unfortunately the Labor government backed down. Um, we're trying to get Woolworths to do it, and if they, if if this vote doesn't get up, it's going to be mighty embarrassing for them anyway. And there's going to be a great deal of media coverage that damages, um, that you know, that shows their brand um, for what it is, which is you know one that um, is putting the putting the food on the table with one hand and taking the food off the table with another hand. And um, and beyond Woolworths, there's also um, West Farmers and Coles who own a great deal of poker machines and. And um, we have a lot of hope that um, we can make progress with them. So it's going to be a long fight, and that's you know it's one battle. Um, okay, but let's win the vote. That's that's the target. We'll, we'll do our best. Are you sure, Helder? Well, it's a, it, it's a bit like the uh, you know the remuneration thing. You don't have to win fifty-one percent of the vote. You've got to get twenty-five percent of the vote, and all of a sudden the, sh the directors were going to get a shock. And in this case, um, what we've learnt from talking to institutional investors is. Anything above 0 0.05, anything above 1% is a massive shock, a massive shock. Uh, and we're already seeing that uh, people who subscribe to the UN Principles on Responsible Investment, fund managers who do so, are starting to uh, analyse whether or not to put a negative screen, is what they call it, on Woolworths because of this and on West Farmers because of, because of Coles' ownership of poker machines. So it isn't just about winning a vote, it's about using a vote to get the outcome that Get Up members are looking for. Um, you were just saying in terms of the fact that uh, we're, we're seeing conservative governments around Australia in states and territories and most likely in the uh, next federal election. I mean, my big concern is in terms of the media, Rupert Murdoch increasing his stake in the media. And so how do you see that we're, that we're going to actually get beyond that? That we, we will end up with some, a government in the future? And I think it'll be a long time before we actually get a, a government in that have a social conscience. So. How, are we going, how do you see addressing that? Mm, I think the media is, a, is an important uh, point, and you know, Simon was talking about it a little bit before hinting at um, 
you know, the concern that GetUp members have been expressing with the state of Australian media and particularly that I think that's been driving the, the campaign about Gina Reinhart refusing to sign the Charter of Editorial Independence for Fairfax. Um, you know, I think that um, increasingly we, we do live in a world of, of these online filters where people choose which news they, they read. Um, and, um, you know, Move On is a um, kind of companion movement or a sister movement to, um, to get up in the United States and, and their former um, executive director, Eli Paris, has written a great book, which uh, you might want to, well, don't read the book, it's a bit long. Watch the, watch the TED talk, that's the trendy way to go, um, called The Filter Bubble, about you know, the effect of, of this online. And Simon hinted at, um, you know, uh, get up members might want to, in the future, create their own media, you know, have, our, have our own source of news, um, have our own filter bubble that we can, um, that we can buy into, where we can get um, news that isn't biased by the, the Murdoch machine or, or by Gina Reinhardt's agenda. And I think that um, increasingly we'll see, you know, we know that print is going out the door, we know that print is on, on the decline and online news is on the rise. So I, I think that that actually bodes well um, for having a media in Australia that is more independent, that is um, more desiccated, that is, um, you know, that is more responsive to, um, to readers. Brett Becker from Climate Action Canberra. People say, and the media says, that, uh, and polls say, that we're less concerned about climate change now than in the past. What tactics can we take to reverse that? I've taken three questions. <laughs> Get the tough one to me. Uh, yeah, there's the head pass. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, there are some positive signs in uh, some of that polling, uh, particularly in the last six to eight weeks. Things are starting to turn around, but what's happened is that people have confused their emotions with regard to the carbon price with their emotions with regard to the issue of climate change. For those who, who still reject the science of climate change, I think what we're seeing actually is implicatory denial. That is, what they're denying are the implications of acting on climate change. Whenever you scratch the surface, and my wife Anna Rose, who recently travelled the world with Nick Minchin, she did well. <laughs> Couldn't have done that myself. The greatest lesson she picked up, spending four or five weeks, you know, with Nick for 20 hours a day, is that what drives him, and what? And gee, that's a tough time, isn't it? <laughs> gee, uh, I really did miss her all that time. Uh, what she what she learnt about him and all the people that Nick took her to see is that what they're most concerned about is governments investing in clean energy, government regulation of markets. That's what it comes down to for them. And that's not where the majority of the public are. The majority of the public uh, fundamentally believe that government exists to, to make a better society for all of us. That is still where the majority of Australians lie. It might not be the case in the US, but it is the case here in Australia. And eventually, when the sting uh, comes out of the tail in terms of the PR machine of Tony Abbott and, and the naysayers, what we'll find is that people will return to that emotion of saying, actually, I want to see something happen here because you guys are have been polluting for free for years and that affects my kids, it affects my grandkids, in fact, it even affects me personally. So I think we've got to give it some time and we've got to remain hopeful over the course of that time. The other thing we've got to do is talk about solutions and get governments to implement solutions that we all agree on. Massively investing in clean energy, growing the renewable energy target, which is the next frontier, in my opinion, on climate campaigning in the next 12 months or so. We've got to shift to talk about those things as well and let the other folks worry about the carbon price because, to be honest, it's the RET that's doing the heavy lifting uh, when it comes to uh, growing the percentage of clean energy that we have in our economy anyway. Uh, so I think there are some, there are some. I guess I would say there's some hope uh, in, all, in the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, as a member of GetUp, I'd like to challenge the idea that um bit of a reverse psychology that we're going to have a conservative future but that may not actually work in our behaviour or in our in our favour due to the fact that we've had such a disparate sort of parliament to work with for the last sort of four or five years that really can't make its, its own mind up and move forward um, and I'm just wondering what is get up's position with the conservatives at this moment in time yeah I think that's a good point um, and look I, I say that you know we face a what could be a fairly depressing time 
Um, not because you know I think that there won't be very uh, very effective campaigns to run, uh, very big wins that um, get members can have under a conserv under conservative governments, um, but because uh, you know there are going to be days like today where we actually see both major sides of parliament sitting on the same side of the house, um, voting for legislation, uh, you know, voting against um, you know limits on detention, voting for indefinite detention of asylum seekers. There are going to be moments like this when we watch both both sides of parliament. Um, you know, voting for things that we think are abhorrent. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, there won't be plenty of opportunities for us. Um, some of the, the, the greatest campaigns that GetUp members have, have run over the last couple of years have been those like mental health, um, where we identified an issue that was off, off the political radar, um, that had a movement of people behind it, that had experts like um, Pat McGrain and Ian Hickey um, behind it, that, uh, an idea whose time had come, and um, we just went out there and made the public case and we convinced enough people and we built up enough of a movement that it didn't matter um, you know, which side of politics was, um, was in power. The, the coalition were the first to come to, well, the Greens came to the party with a, with a policy, the coalition then came with you know, the biggest injection of um, mental health funding that we'd seen in decades with a $1.6 billion policy. And so we were able to get the, the coalition, um, we saw the coalition make a commitment on that um, you know, 18 months earlier than, than the Labor government. And those are the kind of issues that, um, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter what flavour the government is. Uh, if you build a big enough movement, if you make a compelling case, we're going to be able to see some wins. And I think there are a lot, you know, there are going to be a lot of opportunities like that, um, state and federal, um, coming years. I was going to add to that, but let's have the oh, next question. Please. No, 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 no. Let's, let's. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, deeply concerned about the agrochemical industry and also the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you spoke about the manipulative, effectively, manipulative sort of corporations in our, our political scene. And I think that these, uh, there's a number of large companies here which have a lot of manipulative influence. And I think they're really doing bad things for our Earth's health and our physical human health. Um, but I notice that it's really hard to get that um, onto the agenda uh, with people in this country. It's more widely talked about overseas. I just wonder if that's something that, that GetUp's looked at, considered, um, evaluated in terms of, of raising the awareness uh, about those things and getting people on board to do something about it. Can I make some generic comments and I'll leave Sam to talk about GetUp. Um, I, wouldn't tell, I wouldn't wish to overstep the mark. Uh, but uh, uh, I just want to challenge one of your assumptions there. Uh, it is difficult. But I see, as I travel the country, a great trend. More and more Australians are wanting to talk about issues of health. More and more Australians are wanting to talk about uh, the food chain. More Australians are wanting to talk about everything in their life and where it comes from. And I think this is going to be a massive trend. Massive trend. You're right to point to overseas. In America, a lot more people actually want to talk about uh, what these corporations like Monsanto and others are doing uh, to local farmers, for example. In Australia, I still feel that's coming and it's being led by regional Australia because it's people out in country areas who are really at the coal face of this a lot of the time. Actually, it's coal companies, by the way. But let's get to that another time. Um, and so, in my opinion, actually what we're going to see is this become a huge part of the national dialogue. For an organisation like GetUp, and I, I'm at risk here of finding some line at which I should stop talking, um, uh, for an organisation like GetUp, there are moments in the development of a dialogue where GetUp can be most influential. Um, and that is when a movement of people at mass scale is the difference between change and, and the status quo. Uh, and that means that the conversation has to begin. There has to be some base level of understanding in the community. Um, and that's the job of all of us, but also the job of more of smaller, more niche organisations who do the real hard yards. Nothing GetUp has ever achieved, has ever done, uh, other than in partnership with other people in the community. And that's exactly what will happen in the next few years, I think, on this issue, as more and more people collectively organise in small groups and prepare the country for a massive dialogue and campaign about the issues that underpin what you're talking about. No, well, actually, I can cover that completely. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Nice to see you guys. Um, my question, Sam, it was really good to hear you acknowledge that most campaigns don't hinge on a get up petition. Um, and you also talked about that there's a need for greater engagement in action. 
And I suppose my question is, does that happen through GetUp or does it happen through one of the numerous other social movement players who are well established in the area of offline action? Um, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about how you see the relationship between GetUp and other social movement players. Mm, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, I said before that you know no good campaign starts with a petition and, and most bad campaigns end with a petition and I think that um, you know a lot of people look at um, look at get up campaigns and they only see um, they only see the petition they don't see um, you know the the myriad things that get up members do behind behind that from you know the um, the passionate local people who go and are inspired by that campaign and go and meet with their local MP and have face to face conversations and convince them to you know, to the get-togethers that people have where they get together and you know, have a yarn about it with get-up members in their area. Um, and, um, you know, to the, to the ads and the donations and everything else they do. But mo most importantly, they don't see the work um, that people who are not get-up do um, in every campaign that we run. And the way that I think about this is that, you know, um, get-up is, um, get is a kind of infantry that comes in um, at decisive moments in, in a campaign Ah, Galloway, Oh, you're right. We're the cavalry. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> I was bagging you out about um, analogies the other day. It's come back to bite me. Um, so, you know, in, in every campaign that GetUp is involved in, you know, there, there has been an infantry war that's been happening for a very long time. People have been down there actually, um, you know, in, at the grassroots making, um, you know, making headway in, in the local communities, making people, making the issue known, doing the policy work, the, you know, the huge amount of policy work that's involved. And, um, and there comes a point in, in a lot of these campaigns where you, know, you reach a kind of tipping point and there's, it's on a precipice and it could tip either way. Um, and the animal welfare campaign is a really good point. Um, the RSPCA and Animals Australia and myriad other groups had been working on the issue for, for decades. Um, Lynn had gone over from Animals Australia and uh, gone into abattoirs um, with a camera and, um, and borne witness to things in person that um, most of us couldn't bear to watch on TV. Um, she had done this incredible work to, you know, w with Animals Australia and others, to, to push this issue to the point where it was really at a tipping point. And, um, and at that moment in time when the Four Corners episode went to air and, um, and public awareness of this issue really reached this, this crescendo, um, it could have gone either way. It could have tilted back um, into the status quo and nothing could have happened and, and it would have been you know, a whole lot of people decided not to eat meat for a little while and, and, you know, it could have been an awkward moment. Or it could have tipped just a little bit the other way and, and, and you get a government decision. And I think where GetUp um, is most impactful is when it can come in um, at those tipping points and, uh, you know, at sometimes you can just push it a little bit over the edge and, and get a result that wouldn't otherwise have happened. Um, but I, I think that we need to be very aware that that is our role. Um, that is where we best fit in. And you know, on every issue, be it animal welfare or mental health, there have been people who've been working on climate change as well. There have been people who've been working um, on it for decades. And so I hope that when I talk about local action, increasing the amount of, uh, you know, the power of GetUp members in their local community and their connections, um, you know, that that also looks like connecting people back and adding power to local groups, um, like, you know, say if they're in your school of music or people who are campaigning, to say if the, um, you know, the trees on the, Abbey, on the avenue in Tamworth, um, that we can uh, put more power to their elbows. All, all, the, all the community action groups right around the country are climate yeah, change, sure. who, are, who are a great example of people who for years we've been wanting to find the time to um, tell more of our members about, the, about those local issues that are occurring, or uh, even if they're not local issues, local efforts on grassroots but national and international issues. To add one brief point to this, um, I think the most intriguing way to talk about this is community organising and where does it occur, where is it best placed. And what inspires me is the idea that, uh, I bang on about this to other people who uh, run uh, you know, advocacy groups or, or particularly service groups, what really inspires me is the idea that those who are actually providing services on the ground, those who, all those people who are members of ACOS for example, how do we find a way for community organising to happen there? How do we find a way for the person who's going into public housing to help people anyway, turn that into a voice for those who live in public housing? As someone who grew up in public housing myself, I'm really passionate about that as an example because I still think we don't see anywhere near enough community organising there, but 
what we do have are the seeds of something pretty exciting. And in my opinion, it's the grassroots climate action groups that are the shining example around the country uh, of uh, people getting together and, and doing grassroots community organising, not just other forms of activism, but community organising. Can I also say that, you know, when Simon was talking before about um, our campaigning having a 50% by 2020, um, you know, emissions reduction target back in 2008, um, you know, the reason that um, the Get Up ended up with, you know, with that as a message is because we were following the lead of the climate action groups across the country who, you know, frankly had done so much work with, um, get, with Get Up members in local communities that, you know, anything else that um, the Get Up campaign had chosen to, to bang on about would have been unacceptable. Um, so, you know, I think that we often take our lead from, um, from community action. Probably got time for one or two more questions. So. Yeah. <coughs> Probably a naive question. Is there any point in belonging to a political party? Sorry? Is there any point in belonging to a political party? I think so, absolutely. One of the two, pref well... Just one. Yeah, I, I think they only allow you to be a member of one. Is there any point in it? There, but I think there is a point in it. Uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, our challenge as progressives in terms of the political side of the equation is to move every political party to be as progressive as they can. So ha perhaps one of the most strategic things you could do is join the Liberal Party, for example. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think joining, I, I think it's important that uh, people are involved in political parties as well. Uh, social movements and political parties sometimes do different things, but sometimes they do the same thing. Uh, sometimes they get involved in the same way. If it weren't for the members of political parties putting pressure on their leaders, then we would lose a fantastic opportunity. Um, what you're seeing now, for example, in the Labor Party is this all of a sudden obsession. What do our members think? As if for years they haven't been listening. Uh, and, and, and that's exactly, it's necessity, right? Because it's like these political parties realise that, that members are their future and that puts you, all of us, it puts all of us in a position of power. So I think, uh, uh, I say this not being a member of a political party, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, I have been a, at various points in my past and, and I do think that there is a role for political parties in the future. Get Up has a different theory of change and ultimately a more powerful theory of change um, because what it says is that there are outsiders and insiders. Insiders, is it, being on the inside is a very risky place to be because the door can be shut on you at any point in time. Being on the outside with 600,000 people pushing the door open is a very powerful place to be. So uh, even though I'm saying yes, I still think the best place uh, is anything involved in building social movements. I'll just get up. I, mean, I just want to ask, um, I don't know whether you've announced what you're going to do next, but um, would you consider running for politics? <laughs> Good question to finish on. <laughs> you know, I never know whether to take that as a compliment or not, because I look at... Uh, <laughs> I look around me and I say, well, I'm not so sure. Uh, to be honest, my wife and I uh, have, str have struggled to think much past the next few months, and that is uh, getting on the road uh, and uh, seeing so many of the beautiful places that we spent our lives so far campaigning to protect. And I'm really excited about that. I'm, I'm really excited about getting out and, uh, and visiting some Indigenous communities that I've spoken to over the phone so many times over the last few years, dodgy satellite phones sometimes, uh, the homelands out there in the Northern Territory, going up to Broome to James Price Point, uh, another absolutely beautiful spot that I hope to volunteer some time on uh, as well, because I think that's a really important campaign. Past that, I really don't know, but at 26, it would be remiss of me to rule out anything, really. Uh, because uh, uh, because it would uh, would not be truthful for me to say absolutely no, nor would it be truthful for me to say yes. Really, yes, no, it's like that. Why would anyone speculate <laughs> that you had a fish on <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's exactly what uh, an ABC journalist said the other day. It's an easy joke, isn't it? An easy joke, and I'll take it. <laughs> All right, one, one more question, Pat. I've been a supporter of a lot of the campaigns that you've run over the years, and very appreciative of what you've done. Um, but one campaign that I've been a member of a, an organisation that's been running for going over 20 years now, and that's um, drug law reform. Um, we see that um, prohibition of illicit drugs has caused more harm to our community than it ever intended to do. But to try and get change in this area has been extremely difficult. 
I mean, later um, months, I guess, we're a little bit more hopeful, and especially today with Katie Gallagher announcing the needle syringe program in, in prison, a trial at least, um, and Australia 21 uh, putting out a report recently that the provision has failed and we need to at least debate um, different options of handling illicit drugs. But we find that we, we're pretty much alone most of the time, And um, but I was very um, encouraged to hear that GetUp is interested in helping uh, local campaigns. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, should we hold out any hope um, that organisations like yours would help us convince our politicians that at least to have a debate on, on, on different options rather than prohibition to alleviate the misery and tragedy um, that illicit drugs has caused? Yeah, well, I think that looks... Yeah, I thought that too. Um, you know, this, the idea that I mentioned before called Community Run that we've started uh, implementing over the last few months at GetUp is, is a tool for campaigns just like this. Um, for campaigns um, you know, who have a strong moral case, um, organisers who really know what they're on about and who can use uh, you know, a couple more tools to help them bolster their campaign. And what we, you know, I think what Community Run is at its best is you can jump online, you can start a petition and it starts from there. You can gather, you know, lots of, lots of signatures of locals and beyond who can support the campaign and you can get on the phone with, um, with our staff at GetUp and talk about, um, you know, how we work on the campaign, what are your next steps, what's the strategy to succeed, how can you use social media a bit more um, to bring new people in. And... Um, and very often we look at community run as you know a source of um, of new campaigns for get up so um, there are a couple of campaigns that have started on there and we've been able to pick them up and and um, and send them out to more get up members across the country so i think um i really hope that community run is a, is a place that will be of assistance in that campaign and um maybe we can um get on the phone and have a yarn about it and just to, if I could briefly uh, wrap up by uh, just pointing out again something that comes up in public policy a lot uh, that you've raised again here, and that is that uh, we don't all have to agree on the solution to start having the debate. The problem is in, in uh, the media and, and in other places, you know, other town halls, so to speak, uh, what we find ourselves doing is uh, being paralysed by uncertainty. I don't think all of us agree that we should legalise every drug in the country. But the problem is that unless uh, we start saying, yes, that's my policy position, it's very hard to start a conversation and a debate, particularly in the context of larger conversations that occur through the media. And I hope that over the next few years we can all take it upon ourselves to change that because we won't get public policy outcomes unless we work through the uncertainty. So I applaud you for the work that you're doing. I think it's just fantastic. And hopefully I can also help you in lobbying Sam now. <laughs> Look, uh, thanks so much, uh, Simon and Sam, for coming along. And, and not only thanks so much for coming along to talk tonight, but for all the work that you've, you've both done and uh, that uh, Sam's continuing to do. And no doubt, uh, what Simon's very polite, he didn't mention he also has to go have his honeymoon. He's been too busy to actually have his honeymoon. That's so... embarrassing to say. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just let the cat out of the bag and it's getting recorded. I, I, thought, I thought everyone knew that. But anyway, my point is, uh, I think Simon uh, certainly deserves a, a well-earned break and, and I don't think Sam's going to get one for quite some time. Uh, but, uh, but thank you uh, to you both for coming along. And look, you know, the Australia Institute, uh, apart from being... Uh, excited about being able to put on events like this and, uh, and bring people together to hear things like this. I mean, we've, as I said before, worked, uh, uh, worked closely with GetUp on, on a number of issues and uh, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, you know, what, what we as organisations who want to drive change need to do is figure out what bits we're good at and then how to work with other with other groups and and Simon and I and Sam and I have uh, have talked many times about particular things where you know the Australia Institute might have done a bit of research but you know when when GetUp lends its uh, uh, its uh, its megaphone to uh, to our policy conclusions the the message travels a lot further and I I, I do think uh, I think the guys were both very. Uh, 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 very insightful with their answers tonight, but uh, what my view is, I, I don't know if they share it or not, is that I, I think other organisations have to take responsibility for themselves, not just to say, oh, I wonder if GetUp can fix it, 
um, you know, we, we have to figure out, well, what's our role in it? What potentially is GetUp's role in it? And then how can we all do it together? Uh, I think, um, as I said, when, when, when GetUp lends its meg megaphone to a, to a campaign, uh, it certainly gets heard. And I don't think Penny Wong will perhaps ever forgive us for cooperating on some of those uh, campaigns. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes things needed to be said and they were said and they were heard a lot more clearly thanks to, to guys mm. like this and, and to all the people who work at what's now quite a big team at GetUp. So, uh, so just, um, I, as I said, if, you, if you're interested in coming along to future events, make sure you sign up on those things. There's some, uh, some bags, little show bags about the, the work the Australia Institute does, including, you know, the work that we've done with GetUp. So, uh, GetUp members, uh, if, if you're interested in these sort of things, uh, uh, feel free to uh, uh, feel free to look at uh, look at our website and and, and learn from uh, at, you know learn about what we do. But what we do is far more influential thanks to uh, what Sam and Simon and, and the team at Get Up do. So please join me in thanking uh, two remarkable young people.